Hey up Sofa Squad and welcome to the first part of this new series called Locusts Will Eat Your Money. And in this series I am going to be reading you a book that I wrote when I was still a Christian. I wrote this book 11 years ago because I was having serious doubts at the time about the legitimacy of the doctrine of tithing. I no longer believed in the doctrine of tithing. And so I set out to do a Bible study on tithing. I wanted to see what the Bible actually said about tithing. And the results of this Bible study is the book that I'm going to be sharing with you called Locusts Will Eat Your Money. The reason why I called it Locusts Will Eat Your Money will become apparent as we get into it. And the reason why I want to share this book is because even though I'm no longer a Christian, I still think it is relevant. I felt that it was a relevant message for Christians to hear at the time, and I still do. I still believe that Christians need to know that they don't have to tithe. They don't have to give 10% of their wages to the church. And it is my hope that sharing this book will enable them to see that. And I'm hoping that it will be an educational experience. And I'm also hoping that my fellow atheists will find it quite interesting as well. So I am going to read my book, but where I feel it's necessary, I'm going to add some commentary along the way. And my good friend, Critical Cripple, a.k.a. Dave, is going to read the Bible passages for us. And in this first part, I'm going to start with some definitions. I'm going to give a definition of the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, tithing and giving. So, firstly, the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was an agreement between God and the people of Israel given through Moses at Mount Sinai and should not be confused with the Old Testament which is the collection of the books of the Bible from Genesis to Malachi. The Israelites' side of the covenant was that they would keep the laws recorded in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. They were not just to keep the Ten Commandments, but also all the rules and regulations, over 600 of them, collectively known as the Law of Moses. God's side of the covenant was that he would bestow blessings on them for obedience and curses on them for disobedience. For example, if they kept all of the law of Moses, they would be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. You would be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1 For example, if they kept all of the law of Moses, they would be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. And there are many more blessings for obedience, including the fact that 
the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season, and to bless all the works of your hands. Moses told them that in order to receive the blessings, they had to diligently observe all his commandments. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commandments, there were also curses for disobedience. For example, they would be You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. God promised more curses for disobedience than he promised blessings for obedience. And one curse that he promised for disobedience was that locusts would devour their crops. You will sow much seed in the field, but you will harvest little, because locusts will devour it. And uh, <laughs> I've put there that that is from Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 38. <laughs> but uh, that was a, a mistake that I made when I wrote this. Unfortunately, the children of Israel failed again and again to keep their side of the covenant and God eventually sent the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem and they were taken as captives to Babylonia. However, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied about a time when the old covenant would become obsolete and God would usher in a new covenant. God promised that No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The new covenant would be vastly superior to the old covenant because the laws of God would no longer be carved in stone but be written on people's hearts. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. The new covenant. The new covenant is not to be confused with the new testament which is the collection of books from Matthew to Revelation. The new covenant is superior to the old covenant. In the old covenant, people had to keep all the rules and regulations of the law of Moses in order to stay in a right relationship with God. In the new covenant, people automatically gain a right relationship with God purely by having faith in the fact that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again. The old covenant was a covenant based on law, but the new covenant is based on grace. In the old covenant, Forgiveness had to be earned and sins could only be covered over when the blood of a lamb was shed. In the new covenant, God's forgiveness is freely given because Jesus shed his blood on the cross. When Jesus died for us on the cross, he took our sins and conferred on us his righteousness. By believing and trusting in Jesus, we are made righteous in God's sight and justified before him, and it becomes just as if I'd never sinned. You see what I did there? Eh? You see what I did there? <laughs> Yeah, I thought I was clever, didn't I? <laughs> the new covenant is also superior to the old covenant because in the new covenant we are freed from obligations of keeping 
all the rules and regulations of the old covenant. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he set us free from the curses for disobedience of the law, because he became the curse in our place. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. We therefore no longer have to keep the law of Moses because the old covenant is now obsolete. It became obsolete when Jesus ushered in the new covenant when he shed his own blood on the cross. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Instead of keeping the law of Moses, we are now led by the Spirit as to what God's will is for us as individuals. And we are empowered by the Spirit to do his will and be his witnesses. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I think you can tell from that last sentence that I was a Pentecostal Christian. There are times recorded in the Gospels where Jesus speaks of tithing, but only when he was still walking on the earth. This was before he was crucified and ushered in the new covenant. So when he spoke about tithing, he was speaking to Jews who were still at that time living under the law and still obligated to keep it. But we are now living in the new covenant era of grace and no longer have to keep the law, tithing. Tithing was part of the Old Covenant and was one of many obligations for the people of Israel to keep under the law of Moses. It was essentially a tax that the Israelites had to keep. It was not just giving 10% of their income. There was a lot more to it than that. There were a lot of rules and regulations to regulate the tithe. Tithing was actually a complex system of income tax. Some Bible scholars say that there were two tithes required by the law of Moses, while others have identified that three tithes were required. In his book, Tithing, low realm, obsolete and defunct, Matthew Narramore states that tithing was based on a cyclical pattern. He describes the tithing pattern as a three year cycle, seven year cycle, and a fifty year cycle. He goes on to describe tithing like so. Tithing under the law was not a blanket 10% from any and every source of financial increase. Law, by its nature, is specific. The law specifically defined the tithe and the process of tithing. It was to come from the land. It was the increase of fields, vineyards, trees, flocks, herds, and honey from beehives. The tithe 
was not a universal principle by any means. It did not cover every form of financial increase. There were forms of financial gain that did not have to be tithed, such as labour, skilled trades, professional services, commercial enterprise, rents and inheritance. If tithing was a universal spiritual principle in the kingdom of God, he would have demanded a tithe on every form of financial increase, but he did not. God would have also demanded a tithe on the spoils of battle, but instead he gave special instructions for the spoils of battle through Moses that are recorded in the book of Numbers. The high priests just got a tenth of one percent of the spoils of the battle and the Levites got just one percent of the spoils. The Lord said to Moses, You and Eliza the priest and the family heads of the community are to count all the people and animals that were captured. Divide the spoils equally between the soldiers who took part in the battle and the rest of the community. From the soldiers who fought in the battle, set apart as tribute for the Lord, one out of every five hundred, whether people, cattle, donkeys or sheep. Take this tribute from their half share and give it to Eliza the priest as the Lord's part. From the Israelites' half, select one out of every fifty, whether people, cattle, donkeys, sheep, or other animals. Give them to the Levites, who are responsible for the care of the Lord's tabernacle. So Moses and Eliza the priest did as the Lord commanded Moses. Tithing was part of the old covenant law of Moses, which is now obsolete, and it was not a universal principle in God's kingdom, as it only covered specific sources of financial gain and there were other forms of financial increase that did not have to be tithed. Giving. There is a difference between tithing and giving. During the law of Moses, tithing was a legal requirement and it was a must the children of Israel had to pay it as a tax, and if they refused to pay it, they broke the law and were subject to the curses for disobedience discussed above. One such curse was that God would send locusts to devour their crops. Therefore, tithing was not really from the heart as it was something that they were obligated to do or suffer the consequences. Giving, on the other hand, is something different. It is a free will offering, and it is voluntary, it is not a must, and it is from the heart. It therefore does not matter how much is given, as it is up to how the individual has decided in his or her heart to give. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. It therefore does not matter how much is given, as it is up to how the individual has decided in his heart to give. Israelites also gave free will offerings during the time of the Old Covenant. There is an account of free will offering in the book of Exodus. In chapters 35 following, we read of how the children of Israel freely gave offerings with a willing heart towards the building of the tabernacle, and they gave so much that there was more than what was needed and Moses had to tell them to stop. 
So all of the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, The people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord has commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more, because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. This is an example of what can happen when people give willingly from their hearts rather than because they have to under compulsion of law. They give with gladness in their hearts and the end result is that there is more than enough for the work of God. Free will giving is the new covenant paradigm for born again Christians and is voluntary. Christians give what is on their heart to give as they are led by the Holy Spirit and it can be any amount, it doesn't have to be 10% and it doesn't have to be restricted to just once a month. Under the new covenant of grace, Christians are free to give as much or as little as they like and as often as they like, as they have purposed in their hearts as they are led by the Holy Spirit. And it supersedes the old covenant tithing, which was never from the heart, as it was a compulsory part of the law of Moses, which became obsolete when Christ ushered in the new covenant when he shed his blood on the cross. And that brings us to the end of part one. In part two, I will talk about tithing before the law. Specifically, how Abraham and Jacob tithed. So, if you're interested in following this series, do subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you never miss another episode. Okay, bye for now.